So, David, the psalmist, writes, and we saw this in the first segment there, why do the heathen rage? We can answer that now. And the people imagine a vain thing. This vain thing particularly is what this prophecy is talking about. We found that out in Acts chapter 4. They were plotting together the death of the Messiah. Now, David at the time he wrote this did not know that specifically, but that's what's going on. Okay? Now, verse 2. He says, The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Now, in verse 2, we see a prophecy here that the Jewish rulers, and, and when we say the rulers, is the rulers take counsel together with the kings of the earth. The, the Jewish rulers will take counsel together with Gentile kings, unknowingly under the influence of Satan. See, this is the, this is the great trick. These people, when they crucified the Lord and they persecuted all these others to follow Him, they honestly thought they were doing the Lord's work. See, that's the great deception. It, we, you know, we get so wrapped up in the religion and, and all the stuff, and we don't realize that Satan has pulled one of his uh, subtle tricks again. And, um, but this is exactly what happens. is these, The rulers and the kings, they conspired together. Y'all keep your marker there in Psalm 2. We're going to come back to it. Go, ba go over with me, though, to Matthew's Gospel. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Well, I'm going to get there eventually. Matthew chapter 12. And look with me at uh, verse 14. Matthew chapter 12, verse 14. So David prophesied this thing that these rulers and the kings they were gonna they were gonna together conspire together. Uh, Matthew twelve fourteen. Then the Pharisees, these are the ruling caste. They they went out and held a council against him. That is Christ. How they might do what? Y'all see how beautiful the scripture is. I mean, God, God prophesied, I mean, through, through David, prophesied this thing a long way back here. Long, I mean, I need a lot more paper to come back this way, because it was right somewhere about here that he said, this is what's going to happen. You think about that miracle. And that is a miracle. How can any of us predict not just what one person would do, but how a multitude of people would come together and conspire together to do something. Like, that is incredible. That is remarkable to me. Um, go over to chapter 26 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 26. Come down to verse 3. Matthew chapter 26, verse 3. Then assembled together the chief... Oh, yep, Matthew chapter 26. I hate... Rita, no, I appreciate that because you know what that tells me? I, I want to see this. I love that, okay? Matthew chapter 26, verse 3. Then assembled together the chief priests... Again, here's the rulers... And the scribes and the elders of whom? The people. There's that term. This is Israel we're talking about. Under the palace of the high priest who is called Caiaphas, and consulted that they might take Jesus by what? Subtlety and kill him. Isn't the scripture so right? It said this was what was going to happen. Go over to chapter 27, verse 1. Matthew chapter 27, verse 1. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away. And then who did they deliver him to? The Pontius Pilate, the governor. See, it's these kings, it's these rulers conspiring together with the, the, the chief priests and elders. Just like... Yeah, you know, this is amazing. Y'all think about this. These chief priests, these scribes, these elders, they've studied the Scripture... And yet it didn't dawn on them that they are the ones the prophecy was talking about. Here they are literally fulfilling the words of Scripture as they conspire together to kill Jesus. How 
does that happen? We come back to that verse 1. Why do the people imagine such a vain thing? Well, because what happens? Satan, he stirs it up. He beguiles them. You know? It's amazing to me. It's amazing. And then come on down to verse 20. The same chapter, Matthew 27, verse 20. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude. Now here they are. This is the rage part. They're stirring up a tumult. Um, but the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas. Remember Pontius Pilate said you can have Jesus or Barabbas. Which, which is it going to be? <coughs> and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, whether of, the, uh, whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. They said, Kill him. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? Look at this. Even Pontius Pilate kind of recognized here, Hold on, I think we're about to do something really bad here. Now, I, I don't know that he had any inclination of what prophecy spoke of, but he at least had the conscience to say, Are y'all sure? His wife certainly had that inclination, didn't she? She even had a, a vision, right? But they cried out the more, saying, Crucify him. Let him be crucified. Prophecy being fulfilled right there. Um, now, this is what David again called this rage, that the heathen rage. is Why do the heathen rage? And there it is. They're just stirring up this noise. Now, how are the powers that be so able to be so successful with the multitudes to do such evil? How is it that the powers that be, the rulers, have such influence over the masses of people there? Both then and today. It's the same answer, isn't it? <laughs> it's the same answer we talked about earlier. Now come back to verse 3 in Psalm chapter 2. Come back to Psalm chapter 2. The short answer is they deceive. Rulers do just like... So you got the devil deceiving the rulers, and then you have rulers deceiving the multitudes. And you still have even the devil deceiving multitudes through his minions and other devices, other strategies, okay? But it's, it's deception. Now, here's the deception. Look what uh, David writes in Psalm chapter 2. Verse 2, he says, The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Now this doesn't sound like much at first until you really just start inspecting the words here. And this is really interesting to me. This is how they're able to get the masses to follow a path of destruction. They lie as they parade behind religious camouflage, if you will. Essentially what they're saying in verse 3, what David's saying, is that the rulers convince God's people, the people that they are in bondage to God. Look at the statement again. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their, the Lord and His anointed, let us cast away their cords from us. The idea of being banded or corded here means to be bound together, in bondage together. Not necessarily in, a, in an evil sense, but being attached in a union together. And is that not the case with God and the people of Israel? They are in a bond together. They are in a union together. In fact, God even says of His own relationship with Israel, He was a husband to them even when they did not act appropriately, right? It is a real union. It is a bondage there. And so what these religious rulers come along and do is say, don't you guys understand the reason why we're in such chaos now is because of this marriage, so to speak, that we have with God. Don't you understand? He's wreaking havoc in our life. Y'all see the deception? You see what Satan has done? Satan has turned them against their God. That's what he does. And it's through deception. And, and that is, uh, that has led to their demise. Now, you've got to remember something here. 
I want to cut Israel a little slack here. Our, our fellow humans, okay? One of the things that you got to remember to do a lot of times when you're studying the Bible and you read things like this, and we, we sit here, we want to pull our hair and go, why were these people so hard-headed? What were they thinking? Okay? If the world lasts long enough, there's going to be a group of people, a generation out there one day that's going to look back at us and go, what were these people thinking? You know? you got to remember the political climate of that day, especially with the Herods and all these political uh, powers and all the turmoil surrounding the, the land of Israel back in that day, was quite tumultuous. And Israel had been tossed around like a dog on ping pong ball. Okay? I mean, they were just getting... And so, in their defense, to a degree, by the time Jesus comes along... There is a relative sense of peace, relative in the sense that they were kind of being left alone enough to where they could carry on daily life without fear of being just absolutely obliterated. They were kind of kept in check by the rulers of the day. But nonetheless, there was a relative sense of peace. So when Jesus comes along and all of a sudden he's moving and shaking and things are stirring and he's gaining prominence so much so that on the world scene, the, the rulers of the day are starting to worry that he may upset the whole power structure. You got a lot of these Jewish guys come along saying, dude, chill out, man. Keep it down. You're going to get us all killed. And so that's part of Satan's deception here is for them to just take comfort in what the world provides instead of what God has provided for centuries. Y'all see the deception? The deception is don't trust in God. Don't trust in your union with Him. He's the very reason why we even have all this chaos around us. It's deception. It's just outright deception. Again, in verse 3 he says, um, let us cast away their cords from us. Cast away their cords from us. In other words, let's cut the cord. That's what they, that's what they convince these people to do. And that's why we come to this scene over in Matthew where they say, crucify him, crucify him. You know, you think about this. You got mamas concerned about their babies. I just want my baby to grow up and be healthy and happy. That hasn't changed in human history. Mamas have never stopped being mamas, have they? And wives have never stopped having influence in their husbands' lives and in their thinking and the decisions they make. And men have not had uh, any, any lack in their wanting to be at peace and to provide for their families and to make sure that they can shelter their That has always been a human thing. And so I can, to a degree, relate at how easy it is to give in to this notion of just keep the peace, let's not upset the apple cart. It's the same in modern churches today. There is a subtle deception that is going on in churches all across the world these days that says, let's not focus on our differences. Let's only focus on the things that we agree on and let's just keep the peace. And that's where Satan wins. That's where Satan wins. Because doctrine matters. You can't just make up your own religion and call it the truth. You are not God. I am not God. He alone has the power and the authority to not only decree, but to enact and police His will for the day. It's important. And this is what happens. This deception, it takes, it takes hold. But, but you know, these, uh, these Jewish rulers, you know, they, they're, they're saying, hey, be free from the bondage. What's interesting is they were in bondage to the law. <laughs> they were in such religious bondage and, and burdensome religion, they couldn't even see straight. Um, and so in the same way, again, that the rulers in Jesus, they were able to create such a rage and, and plot such emptiness, the same still happening today. Y'all, hold your place there and go all the way over with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now, we looked at this passage a few times, looked at it a couple of weeks ago. But in this context, look at it again. 2 Timothy, and, and just understand the similarity here. Satan has not changed his strategy. He is doing the exact same thing today. Okay? It is through his subtlety and through his, his deception that the world is just departing from what God would have. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, start in verse 1. 
2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. It's on the right side of the Bible. <laughs> if you get to Hebrews, back up. Philemon, then Titus, then 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. And Paul writes, he says, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, please, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the rulers of the day, they have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Let me ask you, how is it, if you come on down to verse 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. How is this possible? And it is because the devil is deceiving. He's having an impact, isn't he? We see it growing more and more. But here's the thing. Try as they may. Come back to Psalm 2 now. I know Reed's like, Dog, I just found 2 Timothy. Now you can make me turn back. I just lost the place. <laughs> there you go. But even as these Jewish rulers try as they may, same today, you know, in the current religious culture, try as people may, they cannot be successful. Okay? They cannot be successful. Um, they cannot overcome the bond that God has with His people. Now, particularly when we look at Psalm chapter 2, look what they say. They say, let us break their bands asunder. That is, the, the bond that God and His anointed has with His people Israel. Okay? The same could be said for today in this dispensation. The bond that God has with the body of Christ. Okay? It cannot be broken. How do we know this? Now, turn. Romans chapter 8. My goal is to make y'all know your Bible forward and backwards. <laughs> and every time you flip page to page, you're learning it, okay? You're handling it. Romans chapter 8. Look with me at uh, verse 35. Now this is Paul to the body of Christ. I'm waiting. Paul to the body of Christ. But in the same way that God had a bond with His chosen people, Israel, that relationship was a covenant relationship. You and I have it by grace with the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? But it's still the same. And, and look what uh, Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? You know, the devil's going to try every one of those. As it is written... For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. So devil, bring it. I'm not inviting it. I'm just in, 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 in essence saying he can bring it. But guess what? We will be more than conquerors through Christ that loved us. He says, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, good or bad, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is, this is kind of, it's not kind of, this is what I love about the grace of God. You and I may fall by the wayside in the sense of getting wrapped up in world events stuff that's going on. We may get wrapped up in worldliness. But if you've trusted in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for your salvation, nothing can stop God from loving you. Not even that.
That's why, as we're going to see in Psalm chapter 2 in your minute, even though there, there were people in Israel that had come to this place where they said, I'm done with you, God. God says, you can try as you may. I still have my eye on you. I want you. The love of God is immeasurable. You cannot outrun it. You will not ever exhaust it. You certainly cannot break it. His will is unshakable. He loves you. He loves everybody. He wants you. And this is an incredible comfort. You know, the truth is that God is an amazing Father, is He not? He is an amazing Father. He allows us freedom. I, th- this is so hard as a parent. Y'all know this, especially as your children get older. you got to give them a little latitude. you got to let them make choices. And there are many times you let them make choices knowing they're going to be stupid. They have an inclination to do the wrong thing, don't they? Just like you. And you have to, as a parent, let them make a choice. But even when they make the bad choice, and this is what the Father, our Father in Heaven does, He disciplines, but He never stops loving. Ever. That's incredible to me. I hope it is to you too. I hope it melts your heart. (laughs) Um, This is an incredible thing. Go back to 2 Timothy. (laughs) Right turn. (laughs) Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter two and look at verse thirteen. Now he's speaking here to believers. Okay? Understand that. To believers. And he says, if we believe not, if we come to this place where we turn our back on God after having been redeemed, after having been justified. We believe not, yet He abides faithful. Why? He just cannot help Himself. For the God of all things to have come to the place where He said... I'm going to let my son die on the cross for these people. That is powerful. God's not going to let that go to waste. <laughs> he loves you. He just cannot, cannot deny himself. He is going to love you. Okay? Um, and the reason why the cords can't be cut as as the the Jewish rulers were trying to convince the Jewish people, deceiving them to do, like, God's the problem here. Y'all need to break free from Him. But the reason why they won't be successful is because God is going to be successful. He is going to do what He says He's going to do. Y'all go all the way back with me to Psalm 84. Psalm 84. Excuse me, 89. I can't read my writing. 89. I knew that wasn't right. Psalm 89. Now, this is God in His relationship with Israel. Okay? But you you still can get at the heart of God and understanding the character of God through this. When we observe, as an outside observer, God's relationship with His covenant people, Israel, and how special they are to Him. And now we know today that He has given us a direct path to have a relationship with Him, and we have that direct relationship with Him. It's much the same way. His character has not changed. God is still the same God. But look at this. Watch what He says. Um, Psalm chapter 89, verse 28. 
My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever in his throne as the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod. I'll discipline them and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. He just cannot do it. He cannot turn back on himself. And he says, uh, verse 36, His seed shall endure forever in his throne. As the sun before me, it shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. Selah. God's not going to turn him back. What does he say over in Romans uh, chapter 11? He, he repents not of his promises. He's not going to turn back on it. Once he makes that promise, it is as sure as the sun and the moon. Now, come back to Psalm chapter 2. You can get there pretty quick. It's marked in your Bible. <laughs> Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing, he says? The kings of the earth, they set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. And all of this plotting and all of this rage, and not just here, but in this span of time, even today, Okay, that this period of history today, the dispensation of the grace of God, is not explicitly here in this scripture. You'll notice. Notice in the prophetic timeline, the body of Christ is nowhere mentioned. The dispensation of the grace of God, the revelation of the mystery, Jew and Gentile being together in one body, is nowhere mentioned anywhere in there. In the prophetic timeline, we just move straight on through. So you have people back here plotting a vain thing. You have this evil. You have kings taking counsel with the rulers of the people. You have them doing all kinds of things, trying to break free from their relationship with God. And so what's the next point in the prophecy, in the timeline? He that sitteth in the heaven, verse 4, shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Now, this is really interesting. And, and if you had a Hebrew Bible here and you started translating the Hebrew text, you would come across some really funny language here. Because in verse 4 where it talks about he, uh, he that sitteth in heaven shall laugh and he shall have them in derision. Um, the idea here, here is that the Lord is going to make these so-called rulers, okay, these Jewish rulers, He's going to make them look foolish. Okay, Because they cannot make God break His promise. Even though they supposedly look, success, look successful in their mission, guess what? He's going to bring them back from the dead. And then, here's what we know now today. They didn't know this then. Even the twelve didn't know this. At some point, even though they would still hate His guts and they would diminish, God would conclude them in unbelief. Guess what? He would push pause on that. He'd push pause on this for a time. And He would intercede right here by His grace. And now, He would use this and give it directly to you so that you can have salvation and have a direct relationship with God Almighty through the blood of Jesus. This is God making a fool of not only the devil, but of these rulers who thought they could break free. That's ridiculous. That's a ridiculous thought that they do that. Um, the word derision here has the idea that they will speak. What was going to happen is that God's going to bring them to this place where they kind of speak unintelligibly. They look smart. They have a form of godliness. They sound very pompous and all this stuff. But they actually end up becoming... They come to this place where they like say two different things. They're talking out of two sides of their mouth. Uh, let me show you this. Go with me to Matthew chapter 22. Man, five minutes. I'm not anywhere close to where I wanted to be today, but it's okay. Matthew chapter 22. all the way down to verse 34. Now, watch this little scene. This is a scene where Jesus is, is having a conversation with, Pharisee, with the Pharisees. Okay, The ruling caste here. This is before 
This is before his crucifixion. But again, remember, they're, they're taking counsel together with the kings and each other, and they're trying to figure out how they can kill Jesus. Now watch how God is going to laugh, and in his... This is almost like a, a, a mad laugh, like an evil laugh, like, ah, ha, 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 you know, kind of thing. What's that? Like Truman, just like, yeah, this is a good example, just like Truman. Uh, you see that? That's, uh, that's so passive aggressive. Yeah, it is. It's deceitful. And, uh, but, but they think, boy, we've got this. We've got this. And God's going to have them in derision. He's going to have them speaking so unintelligibly. Watch this, verse 34. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Oh, okay, well, the, he might get the Sadducees. He's not going to get us Pharisees. Then one of the Pharisees, which was a lawyer, always watch out for the lawyers, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? It's always about the law with these folks. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? I love this. How Jesus, he is such a master. And he just flips, he turns the table so quick. What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And they say unto him, the son of David. And he saith unto him, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord? And now Jesus is going to quote the Old Testament prophets. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? So smart. And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. He shut them up. You know why? The Psalm chapter 2, verse 4 says, The Lord will have them in derision. They'll be so mixed and muddled in their thinking, they just think they've got this. Not so fast. Not so fast. And even though they come to a place where they're have so-called success by worldly standards and by the standards of the devil in crucifying the Lord. We saw this just a minute ago. Um, not so fast. God is still able to take that and provide for all of humanity redemption. Um, today, again, because the majority of the Christian rulers, so to speak, at large have denied the Word of God through the Apostle Paul, many are speaking unintelligibly. We see that today. Lord, the prophecy in Psalm chapter 2 doesn't necessarily concern today and under the disposition of the grace of God, but do we not see that there are many who are in derision? They're speaking unintelligibly. They, they, they are absolutely in derision. We see that. In fact, Paul speaks of this. Turn over with me. Take a right turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. The reason why we keep going back and forth to Timothy is because uh, Timothy, Paul's writings there have a lot to do with these last days. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and look with me at verse uh, 3. We've got just a couple more minutes. I'm not going to be able to get anywhere close to finishing, but anyway. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. Paul writes to Timothy, he says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Okay? He says, neither give heed to fables. The word fables here in the Greek is the word muthos. It's where we get our word myth from. That they uh, neither give heed to myths and endless genealogies. Um, the idea of genealogies here, what would happen is these guys would, would talk about their genealogy. And what they were trying to do is trying to substantiate their pedigree. Y'all hear this a lot and in a lot of modern theological circles. Well, where did you go to seminary? What letters do you have behind your name? They're taking heed to genealogies. They're trying to puff themselves up by their pedigree. I can tell you all, i got a bunch of letters after my name. And it's as good as alphabet soup. It's all mixed and muddled. Who cares? I didn't learn anything. Now some can point at me and say, Well, Greg, maybe you were a terrible student. My grades don't say that. By the standards of my professors in the colleges, I was a stellar student. In fact, I got a scholarship for it. And you know what it means? Absolutely nothing. In 
And Paul here says, he says, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edification, edifying which is in faith. So do. He says, Now the end of the commandment, that is to teach no other doctrine. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. There's a lot of derision out there today. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Do you see how even today, even though we're in an unprophesied period of time, right here in this period of history, this is an unprophesied. In other words, it does not show up in prophecy. This period, this dispensation of the grace of God right here, it is not in prophecy. Yet still, Scripture holds true. And, and even at this point in time, you see a lot of derision out there. You see a lot of unintelligible speaking. People who have, as Paul said over there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, a form of godliness, but they're denying the power thereof. They have yet to understand the rightly or see the rightly divided word of truth. They have yet to, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, uh, 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 surrender to God's will, and that is that that the Apostle Paul is the Apostle to the Gentiles. It is through his ministry that we are to order our walk and our life today. It is under the dispensation of the grace of God that we exist today. We're not under law, we're under grace, he says. And today's salvation is by grace through faith, nothing added. And yet many today want to deny that and deny that and deny that. And just like the rulers of Jesus' day, they're confused. And Satan has duped them. And now God has caused them to be in derision. He says he's laughing in the heavens. He's got them in derision. Now the, in the prophetic program and the timeline of prophecy, the dispensation of grace, the divine in interruption, it's not found. But again, the order, it still stands even though this is an interrupted time. There was the plot, if you will, um, to, to kill Jesus, then God had him in derision here. Uh, and then we get uh, the error of crucifying the Christ. And now, in the prophetic timeline, we've got God's judgment coming up. 